John laid out yesterday, the way this uh, the debrief works for umpiring and, and uh, our match race and team race events is we, we identify the match and flight and then we get the, t the two parties involved in that match as well as the umpires to explain what the call was or what they saw. And uh, obviously everybody saw different observation angles, so uh, that's how we approach this. So throwing it out to you. Any issues that we want to uh, chat about? Any situations? Hmm? Flight three. Flight three, race two. So that would be umpire three over here. Uh, and who are you sailing against? Okay, why don't you come up and set it up, and uh, your, uh, your, your opposite, opposing uh, team would uh, contribute theirs as well. Set up where we use on the course. Uh, where are we talking? Right. First top mark, coming yeah. in. I don't remember what colors we were. Uh, I think we were yellow, my name was uh, blue. We ended up in a situation like this, coming out of the mark. Yeah. Uh, Neither spinnaker was flying. Uh, they were getting ready to put theirs up. We had held off on ours. Okay, uh, guys, just listen up when he's talking, and he'll set it up, and then we'll we'll discuss it afterwards. We don't need a side discussion. Yeah, we're probably I just left this two bowling circle and go for a left, and I uh, got to about here, and uh, would would have hit them if I had continued, um, and then had to come back down. Uh, flag and it went green. I was wondering okay. what was seen there. What, what did um, you see? It was very, like, I don't disagree with this is the only difference. I don't know why I couldn't avoid it as much as he wanted me to. But my perception is that since we were kind of, like in this situation, as he was coming up, in order for me to turn up, my, my stern had to come down into him. So I did, was doing one of these where I like, avoid to get room, avoid to get room, and he couldn't round up as fast as he wanted to because as he comes up, my bow, my stern's going down to avoid. Okay, so that so, was your explanation that you were windward boat. Yeah. Okay, and umpire three. It was match two. Uh. Uh. It was maybe. flight two. Flight two. Flight three. 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 Yeah, I think it was match two. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. We sort these things yeah, out. Yeah, we, we talked about this. Um, as, yeah. as you guys were going around the mark, yes, we saw that um, yellow was going to delay putting their kite up, so we were watching for the luff. And as this boat came around, um, we were watching to see if this boat would pick up on that, that this boat was ready to love them and if they would be able to respond to that love. And, and they did. And I will agree with you that it got very close, but what we thought, what, what we saw was as you left, we saw you left to try to avoid. We saw this boat come back down and then left again and again you came up and responded. And then this boat came back down again and that's when you threw your wife away. So we felt that this boat had kept clear, um, had you wanted to continue to love longer, you could have, but we thought it was your choice to break off and not continue to love, and he had kept clear, so that's why we did it. Yeah, the <coughs> Northwestern statement there is that they came up and stopped in order to avoid contact. Yes. And what you just said was that that Windward avoided, I mean, stayed clear, kept clear, because through the whole incident. Does, does that mean that well, just because you don't like the decision? You know, <laughs> the, back, the back leg collapsed. <laughs> that was our fault. What would, what would Northwestern have had to do to convince you that they wanted to go they wanted to luff further toward head to head <coughs> and couldn't, and therefore, yeah. when we're just
should have been penalized. If, and, we, and we talked about that afterwards, and we thought, could, could you have uh, continued to alter and not had contact? And we both agreed that, no, we, Northwestern probably couldn't have continued to work without having contact. So did uh, Miami break the rule? And, and we did talk about that afterwards, and we thought we may have um, missed out on that opportunity, so to speak. Um, but again, it, it didn't last very long. So had you, had you come up and held that maybe a fraction of a second longer, or continued to show that you couldn't come up any further? But it, it came up, and it was a very, very quick reaction to come back down again. And because we had already done that once, we thought it was basically your choice to not continue to love, that you, you got your love in, and you wanted to head back down to go to the floor. So we thought he kept clear. But in hindsight, we did talk about that, that had he wanted to continue that love, we probably shouldn't have been penalized. Thanks, yeah, my goal was to come all the way ahead to win. Okay, okay. yes. And what it sounds like is, when I came up the first time, um, I lost a lot of speed, so I came back down. And the second, they thought it, he did a good job of keeping clear. And it was the second one that I came up, and I needed to just wait a little bit longer and hold a course there, and then before I bared away. Yeah. What I did was, is I came up, and there wasn't any contact, so I sort of just avoided it. Was, it, was a quick I came up. it was It was real quick. And like I said, in hindsight, yes, had you come up and held that course, maybe you could have held that course longer, we would have understood, oh, you want to continue that love, and you Okay. And we probably and, and you would have bought the penalty because we were very close to penalizing you. But again, we said it was one of those quick things and back down again. We thought, okay, you accomplished what you wanted to accomplish and you kept clear. But in hindsight, yes, we probably missed um, missed the fact that you wanted to continue that love. And and the, the next time we were bluffs, but when you do go up there, you just go up and then drop back down. <coughs> It, it kind of looks like you've gone as far as you wanted, then drop back down and, and flag. But if you go up and hold it for two heartbeats, and then drop back down and turn around at the umpires and go pick this or something, right. then, then maybe you could have conveyed the information that you wanted to. You wanted to stay up there, but you just couldn't. And your shoots weren't up here, were they? No, I had delayed shoot. His shoot was. Uh, uh, I think it was trying to come up, okay. but it never filled, so it was not flying. All right. And a situation with one boat without their shoot up and the other with, there is an issue of luffing the boats up when you have the shoot, you relinquish it, give them a chance to get their shoot down, and then continue. That wasn't the situation for both boats here. How would we treat that? Well, the, the call is that, that if, if the lured boat luffs, and the windward on the spinnaker boat collapses. And the leeward boat wants to keep luffing. It's unseamanlike for the windward boat to sail upwind with their spinnaker flying. So the seaman the seaman like maneuver is to is to bring the is is to drop the spinnaker. Start doing something. Start doing something to get it in. And and therefore the call says that you leeward can luff. If the spinnaker collapses, leeward should stop and give windward a chance to get their spinnaker in, and then she can continue. But if she just keeps going and takes her to the moon with the spinnaker flying all over the place, it's it's unseamanlike and leeward's at fault. I don't know if I'm articulate enough to explain that clearly. No. Is there an actual number in there, percentage of the? I guess this is, that exact situation came up with me at uh, the July grade three in the Chicago Metro Center. And I forget against who it was, but it was coming to a finish uh, like this. And this was us, this was them. <laughs> we went the initial luff, very similar to the situation up here. Came, they started taking down the spinnaker and had some issues with it, and then came back up in the deep. <coughs> something came out saying like half their sail was still full, and they were having it seem like manner of taking it down, so it was their penalty. Do you, do you guys, an umpire, normally, are you look, what are you looking for in terms of them getting it down? Are you saying that crew members were just trying to get it down? Or are you saying that the sail was all the way in the boat before they had to continue their life? To get her to continue to go up. 
Did I not articulate that well? I don't think I've ever seen a window without actually trying to take their spinnaker down. To be, to be truthful, I've never seen a window go try to take a shoot down. But the call that we have in the call book says that we have to give them the opportunity to take the shoot down because it's unseamanlike to go ahead and do anything to shoot up. So what you do is you pause at 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and if nobody does anything, then you can continue your luck. If they start to take the shoot down, then you've got to give them a little room to take the shoot down. But that doesn't mean they can blow the halyard just let the halyard fly either. We've got to keep them under control. I think like Don had said earlier, the, or, or Pat had said earlier, when you relinquish your love, if, if you're, you have conviction about it, love <laughs> to the extent that you can, at the rate that you can, and then impress upon that you, you've done everything, you within your rights and what your obligations are, and did the windward boat do that? So in this case, that was when you relinquished, I guess that's as far as you wanted to go, you wanted to head down the course, so at that stage it was a green, Paul, um, yeah. maybe yeah. pressing further, it would have been differently. Yeah, let me, let me just add to Cliff, at that, at that point, because you, you came up, and at that point, it got clear because you stayed clear. But at that point, had you held it just a fraction longer, and then <coughs> and issued your play, we would have said, yes, that was a penalty. Because now, there's no, he's not keeping clear, because now he's not come up any further. So, had you held it just a little bit longer, like you said, you talked about it afterwards, and maybe we just thinking in that regard, we thought that because it was such a quick well, yeah, out back down, that, and he kept clear, but there was no problem. <coughs> However, had you held that, and then we penalized, or we played, he would have done it. Sweet. Well, thank you. Okay. Something else? Another situation? Uh, let me throw one out. Um, this was between two pairs. This is the other pair coming in. Port tack lay line. Starboard boat coming in here from another match. I believe this was Wisconsin. Um, we were winging on this. I'm just observing. Uh, I don't know, I didn't have an, a line on how far you went up before you tacked. You were, you were entering in the zone clearly on starboard. Uh, we were going to actually go past them. That was our initial You were trying to go past them. You wanted to stay outside? We were trying to with their race. We tried conveying that to them. Well, we, yeah, it, just from my, my position here on the wing, I was, I was just wondering, I said, we heard you were certainly asserting your, your position in starboard, and we thought that at least on my view, was you, you might have gone a little far before you had to tack. Now, there, there is a requirement under Appendix C that we don't interfere with other matches. Now, you were in, within your rights port starboard, but at maybe another event, and should one of these or both of these boats flag, that you were maybe breaking or red flag in that situation, that you were doing something unsportsmanlike by interfering with another match. Potentially, there might be some scoring issues here, that you're close. That, that might be a situation that could, could be expanded on by these boats should they pull a red flag on <coughs> They're clearly the giveaway boats as port. Would you agree? So I, I was just wondering, you, you were trying to get beyond them? Yeah, well, because we were coming in on starboard, and then we were like, well, we should try and not mess up their race, so then we were going to try and sail past that. Oh. Yeah, I, I, the umpire was back here. I didn't see, I didn't see the line on, on what they were doing, and I, it, it, everybody going to the right seemed to get lifted today. So they, they might have gotten lifted up a little higher, and, and that just kind of exacerbated the situation. But it, you need to watch that interfering with another match. We also saw hairs coming down here. I think it was subsequent here with blue number one coming in. Uh, these are the giveaway boats. Uh, we, we very frequently within a match, if it gets separated to some degree and the lead boat comes around, you'll see a, a wing will be hanging down here or the other umpire. 
you might have a wing down here, an umpire at the top end watching this lay line. This boat has an obligation not to sail above their proper course when they reach the zone, which is two boats. <coughs> so you might be high up here, but once it hits, they need to keep clear, but you cannot sail above your proper course. They could flag and you could get a penalty on that approach. So there's an obligation on both boats, one to keep clear here. And we saw some boats come down rather quickly. Many were staying high to get their chutes filled and then coming down. But we saw a, a fringe of boats coming through here on two occasions, kind of lacing their way through, boats approaching on the starboard tack lay line. So you need to be cognizant of that if you're, if you're on the upper side and your chute's up. Stay high and clear. You don't want to get that foul either from another pair, which could have been a two or another pair coming up. You could still foul another boat. The situation there is the umpire of the match is the only one that can assess a penalty. So if boat number two were to flag against a number one pair, this pair's umpire needs to assess the penalty based on this flag. You might be signaling your Yankee flag to your umpire, but they can't penalize the other pair. So hopefully there's, there's some dialogue. And th that situation does occur because we have multiple matches on a course at any time. We might have umpires calling one another. We might have a, a, a match overlap here, a match engagement. Um, so stay cognizant if there's a, a flag flung because we, we, we can only assess penalties to our pairs, not to other pairs. There'd be no way of denoting that. <coughs> Anything else from some other umpires? I don't want to hog uh, things. I've got some others myself, but. I just got a few uh, others. The, um, Preset spinnaker poles going into the weather mark, whether you're on port or starboard. Um, if, you're on, uh, if you're on port, it's easy to preset your spinnaker pole and, and get it up and then just do a bear away and, and go. If you're on starboard, set it up to leeward. And then as you, when you tack and go around, it's that front person's responsibility to move the pole forward and not let it fly back. If, 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 it, if as, you're, as you're pulling the guide back, if that pole comes back and there's three meters between the pole and the, mat and the spinnaker, as it goes up, the spinnaker is not going to go up and set. <coughs> so you need to have that front, it's the front person's responsibility to make sure that the guy is being fed into the, so that the spinnaker goes all the way into the pole. Does that make sense on there? Um, the, um, uh, <coughs> let's see, shoots, spinnaker should, you should, you should call for the drop of the spinnaker 30 seconds before the leeward mark. All right, and we were, this morning we are going a little bit slow. We were guessing, uh, how fast <coughs> do you think you were going this morning? Four knots? Okay, four knots is two meters per second, 30 seconds is 60 meters before the leeward mark is when you call for the spinnaker drop and everybody starts. You, you, the, 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 um, <coughs> the, shoot, the, the jib goes up and you start getting ready to pull it down. All right, you just, you got too much to lose there, <laughs> as we noticed a couple times today, um, to, to, uh, uh, to screw that up. It's better to get it done early and, and worry about it. A um, <coughs> couple times, Spinnaker halyards, when they got pulled all the way up, the, the halyard puller was so excited that they just pulled it like mad and bam, the, the, uh, the, the, the shackle got pulled into the mast pretty hard, hard enough so that it wouldn't twist. So there were a couple leeward legs where the whole, the, <coughs> the spinnaker about that far away from the mast had about two twists in it and it was just all jump, jumbled in and you guys probably had about a 95% spinnaker compared to the other boats, 100% spinnaker. So who's ever pulling the, the halyard up has a responsibility once it's up just to do a quick look to A, make sure it's all the way up and B, make sure it's not up too much. Um, first of all, the jibs downwind. I know in sonar typically you're supposed to drop the jib yeah. to the flow, but this is a really short course. 
I know on our boat we had a problem. By the time we got the jib down, it was time for the jib back up. Um, I'll get it I mean, down sooner. You would still recommend taking the jib down. I well, I, let me just say that that in the in the in the uh, match racing events that they had this summer uh, here in Sonars and the ones that. I've coached or, or watched or umpired in other places that even on these pretty short courses that the, the top crews have, have gotten to, to, to drop them on there. Um, and there's a, there's a uh, what, <clears throat> there's a ballet grade on the, uh, on the bow people. Uh, there's some bow people that walk up there and just, you know, are clumping down and they're taking about three steps in order to get into position to do something and then three more steps and it kind of looks like, it kind of looks like me on the front of a bow. It's not, it's not a pretty sight. Um, and there's other people that, that have already thought about where they want to put their foot when they go up to, to uh, jibe the spinnaker pole, for instance, and they'll, they'll put their foot pretty far outboard on the other side, uh, a little bit further than normal, so that their, their butt is wedged against the, uh, the mast. So when they drive, jive the pole, everything is just one smooth motion to, to grab it, click it, and then move it out and re-click, all right? And then if, they're, if they do go forward, you know, it's only that one step to go forward. You can <coughs> put the pole, I mean, put the uh, jib down, all right, and then one step back, and from even from those two feet positions, you can kind of slide your butt around the mast and already be sitting on the top of the the uh, 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 the cabin top, looking backwards <laughs> to see where the next puff is coming from to tell your skipper if if coming up a little bit or dropping down a little bit is going to help. All right, does that make sense? So so be be elegant. Um, you want to go for a while? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, just a show of hands. I mean, we saw some lead changes in the ladder mat, in the ladder flights. Uh, but show of hands, did anybody who did not win the start win the race? Okay, by, by team. How many, how many teams won? Okay, so we did, we did uh, three times seven. 21 races we had. What, four races were won by teams that did not win the start? <laughs> three times. Three? We did it three times. Though. Oh, you did it three times. Yeah. Well, these are the kings over here. We don't know how to start uh, at all. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no <laughs> idea how to start. You guys suck. Yeah, the, the engagement <laughs> yeah. at the start. We, <laughs> it's a good <laughs> suck, though. You know where your mistakes is. <laughs> <and> you <laughs> can fix it. You made up for it. At the moment, you <laughs> Uh, some of the early matches, we saw timing's critical. You know, you don't want to be too late. We saw some of the starboard boats attack. We saw some of the, we saw on one occasion, port entry was right on time. He came in and kept starboard out. Um, those, are, those, are, those are unforced errors that your competitor made that you should take advantage of. They're clearly unforced. Early entries are unforced on yourself. You know, that's just, that's just, uh, uh, something that you really want to try to avoid. We saw some people heading out uh, in uh, no man's land over here. Uh, I think the, the race committee had lengthened the line. The line was pretty, pretty well balanced today. But when you get out over here, uh, <coughs> continue up this way or further out this way, just stop the action. And we saw some opportunities where uh, the boat that was trapped could have maybe scraped off their competitor around the pin. Uh, I was thinking one situation right here that they were coming up, coming up. They clearly wanted to go back to the right and they were bow out. They probably could have gone over right here and this boat would have been at risk of tacking right into the pin. So it's a, it's a way of preventing your, your competitor from getting at you. Uh, Downwind, I think it was maybe the boat that you were talking about where they had the bow tie spinnaker. Uh, and uh, competitor was in, they were in a, uh, I think that was, uh, they were both on port. So that boat was the windward boat. Uh, if somebody is having a hard time, make it harder for them. 
Um, Liz Bayless does a lot of uh, uh, workshops for WIMRA, the Women's International Match Race Association. Her tagline is, make your competitor uncomfortable and make yourself more comfortable. And if you're behind, do something. Uh, following your competitor on one tack or the other, uh, it's only, a, there's a one or a zero at the end of the race. You don't get a second place. So try to, if you start to press your competitor to cover you, they may miss a jive or a tack on one occasion. <coughs> and that's, that's where you're going to make these incremental gains. Uh, just un, un, untaken opportunities, I guess, were, were some things I saw today. Should we, should we talk for a second about downwind tactics? Would that make sense? Yeah. That's good. There's another, here's a black. They, um, uh, Black machine. How many, how many, <laughs> this is one of the first five match racing opportunities that they've had. Okay. Um, this is exciting time for you guys, I think, because the, really, match racing is just pattern recognition. And, and the, the great thing about match racing is that, that randomness hardly ever fits into match racing outcomes. That you're so close that, that you, you know, random things just don't happen to one boat and not the other boat very often. You always have an opportunity to, to respond and, and thrust. And, and uh, so this is a, um, one of the patterns typically on downwind, it, typically downwind, there's a, the triangle is a little skewed, all right? There's usually a short leg and then a long leg, all right? Ideally, what you would like to do is on the, the, the boat behind, this is the chance for the boat behind to pass. Might be your only chance. Um, and, and certainly, certainly 90% of the passes that do happen, happen on the downwind leg on here. So one of the, one of the, the tactics going upwind is to, to for, the, for the trailing boat, is to do everything possible to stay close to the lead boat. And if you can, if you can get to the, uh, you, you've, if you can get to the weather mark within a boat length and a half or two boat lengths of the, of the lead boat, then you've got a really good chance of passing them downwind. A really good one. You go around the mark, <clears throat> and it's, let's say it's just a bear away. <coughs> All right. What, what you want, the outcome at the end is, on the, on the last leg is that blue, or the trailing boat, wants to be on yellow's wind all the way down to the mark. So what's happening here is that blue is not trying to go to weather. All right, because if blue, if blue tries to go to the weather, what does yellow do? You know, hopefully just kind of takes them up, traps them up there, takes them up, traps them up there, takes them up, keeps going as far as possible, and then just as blue gets yellow's wind, yellow jibes and leads blue on the, on the long downward leg. All right, so what does, what's blue trying to do? Blue's trying to push yellow as far over here as possible, and wants to say below her. All right, wants to get below behind to leeward of the center line, and just push her as far over as possible. All right, and then, and then the, that critical moment when yellow jibes. Blue is trying to jive right on her wind. All right, and how do you tell? How do you tell if the other boat's on your wind or not? What do you look at? Telltales. All right, because the telltale is pointing directly toward your apparent wind shadow. So if even if the wind's like this, if you guys are moving a little bit. All right, your parent wind will be forward a little bit, 
and the wind shadow for blue is going to be back in here just a little bit. All right, and this jibe, so when you're sailing here, the apparent wind is going to be a little bit forward because you're moving. All right, and then she jibes and then blue jibes perfectly so that as the apparent wind moves forward, yellow's right in the wind shadow. All right, and that that <coughs> jibe and getting that just right and anticipating what the wind strength is and how fast the boats are and everything else takes lots and lots and lots of practice. Lots. All right? And then and then <coughs> ends up going down. Now now how to defeat that strategy and stuff like that is is hours of of discussions over beer on there and, and uh, how you get around and how you jive early and, and stuff like that. But the basic principle is leader, <clears throat> leader goes up, trailing boat sags down below the leader's, <clears throat> the leader's uh, uh, course, you know, and, and even, even if you know, even if the, that's the long one, and that, this is going to be the short way. You know, this is the only, the only thing you can do is try to maneuver the leader into a position that when they do jive, you're going to be right on their wind. All right? And, and then hopefully you can get off in front of them. So, you know, if, if the leader is getting into trouble, she might, uh, she might want to jive early. And so that she can come down here and then have another port tack jive to get to the mark. There's a lot of the, the chess of what goes on and the thinking of what happens in the tactic. Uh, you can talk about forever. But um, um, that's more or less the principle. All right? First part of the leg, the boat behind sags, setting themselves up so boom, when they jive, they're right on the wind. Okay? Make sense? All right. I uh, saw one situation where a boat had an outstanding penalty. I think it was St. Thomas took the uh, penalty shortly after the start. Uh, was that a, did you see an opportunity there that, that I didn't see or? Uh, they got yelled at. <laughs> the, what, were you, what were your thoughts there? <laughs> Well, uh, okay, here's the other thing. I, I asked Don, I, I got there a little late. Were you able to uh, listen with Don's discussion yesterday? No. No. Okay, you were late. Well, maybe this was one of the nuggets that Don left for everybody. Uh, if you have a penalty and, you know, your, your opponent's split from you, maybe over here, and who has a penalty on, one of the easiest ways and then this is maybe a recap for some of you. Uh, you're getting toward the ley line, anywhere near it. You want to go this way. How about going that way and taking your penalty? You get to go, come out, take your penalty, come out on the, on the right of way tack, right of right, boat. Uh, by the time that, that's such a quick situation, going upwind right there it probably cost you a bit. Uh, I don't know that you wanted to go that particular way. Uh, it sometimes works on port as well when you get separated. A situation like this, it's sometimes unexpected. If there's some separation here, this boat will break toward their competitor and come back around. It's less likely here. You need some separation, but the response there would be this boat should come around immediately when they see them going down. Uh, this boat needs to keep clear when they're taking a penalty. So. Unless this boat is sure that they have maneuvering room to get through this, get back up to a close hauled course, uh, and, and come out in this situation, they, that, that's, that's a lower risk move over here. Very opportune situation at the starboard tack ley line. That was just one observation I saw. Well, okay, they took it. Uh, Cliff, yep. the other thing we talked about last night is if you're behind with a penalty, there's no reason to take it until you get to the finish line. Yep. 
Yeah. If there's if you're if there's great distance, and, and Don said, you know, the a competitor could today. I was thinking, all right, somebody's eight boat lengths ahead. <coughs> what if they drive and the Fordex all overboard? They're going to be recovering their crew. That's that's their mistake. That that their error. But the other boat can monopolize on that and, and gain ground. So don't take that penalty until that point uh, that you need to uh, at the end of the race. Or there might be the opportunity, we saw some boats come very close up here uh, in the situation in a luff. If the, if the uh, Northwestern boat that was lured had a penalty on a luff at the top end mark and tagging your, not tagging, but getting a penalty on the other boat removes your penalty, remove, you know, they both nullify one another. So that's the other option of, of getting scrubbing off a penalty on yourself by drawing a penalty to your competitor. Uh, you have to be in striking distance to do that. But like I said, if you were trailing back here and this first boat didn't keep clear, as long as you met your obligations, if they don't, they could buy a penalty if you were holding one here. So you don't even need to be that close. You need to be in a crossing or an engaging situation. This is on different legs, but they're obliged to keep clear. If they don't do so, and you've complied, you fly a flag, and they might they might draw that penalty if the umpire, umpire saw the situation as such. Yes? Um, I have a question about the flags, Pardon? Um, the protest flags. Yes? Because I remember not only was there the, the Y flag that, on the stick, there's also the red flag and the green flag. Right. States. Okay. The green flag really is for breakdowns. What's the red flag for? Well, the Yankee flag is flown for part two rolls. Right? The yellow flag. Right. The, the yellow. The yellow one. Yellow <coughs> Yankee flag. The yellow flag. So that's roll 10 through 23. Something outside of that. Now, the situation I, I put up here where you had two boats from another match. Starboard boat coming in. If these boats felt that they, this boat may have broken two by inter, by by over by crossing here as a starboard boat, but maybe taking more room at the top end, and these two boats may have been close, they would have flown a red flag. Part two or a rule two is not a part two rule. So red flags are for those rules that are outside. Any further discussion? Yeah, the famous one is uh, Dave Perry being disqualified in a race in the Congressional Cup because his mainsail was raised an inch above the band on the maps. That was a red flag protest. It was not a rule of part two of the formation. Now, would that even apply if it says we are not sailing with sonar class rules? These are sonar type boats. How would so it, it, might, it might have come in somehow. But it, it could be something else. But the other reason for taking your penalty is always taking your penalty term in a race, even if you're behind, is because the other boat could be disqualified later after the race. And if you don't, if you haven't finished, which you will be if you don't do penalty term, it will be DNF. If you haven't finished, you can't complete the race if the other boat is disqualified. And that could even affect potentially a tie break situation. It could affect a tie break. Somebody could be over. Yeah, so it, it's, you know, it, it uh, we were, we were, well, Don, you were doing a discussion <laughs> last week when we were up in Minnetonka doing the Richardson's Cup, and uh, it was, it, it's even about, I, I, I heard the word posture, you know, you get behind, and, well, we're second here, uh, you know, do something, that, that's what came out of that, don't give up, don't, Make, make your competitor respond to something you do. If, if they're going to keep a cover on you, make them continue to cover. You know, it's cold, you keep warm by attacking or jiving. Anything else? Yes? I can't see. That's Mark. Mark I, I had a couple of, a couple of, uh, sort of no thought. Uh, I like rules where I just I just know I'm going to do it. I don't have to think. All the stuff we've been talking about, you've got to think pretty hard on the course. There are three things I notice that you don't have to think at all about, and they're going to save you 
uh, something, maybe a little bit of uh, time in the race and maybe a little bit of time before one of the races, right? So the first thing is tape your halyard. Tape the jib halyard and the spinnaker halyard. Tape the shackle shut. You don't have to think about it at all. If you switch boats, make sure that's one of the first things you check. If that goes up the mast while you're sailing, that's no breakdown. You can't call for a breakdown then. In fact, some of the sailing instructions and the events we've been doing say you don't get breakdown points even if it's between races. So tape those things shut. It's just something you don't have to think about. Second thing, I think somebody already mentioned, uh, we saw a lot of mistiming <coughs> issues at the, at the box entry. People weren't close to the box at the four minute. Um, what my team and I do is at seven minutes, we start making practice runs at the box. So at seven minutes, we go hit, we go across, we tack out, we tack again around 25 seconds or so, we come back and we get it. And by the time you start, we've done it four times. You do it at seven, six, five, you've got three practices, and finally the last one, you're always on time and you're never more than 25 seconds away from the line. So just start, that's one good way until you're really good at timing the starts. Just start going back and forth and back and forth. And then the last thing is if you're behind, especially on the second beat, I think Pat mentioned, if you're going up the, if you're going up the first beat, do what you can to stay close if you're behind. On the second beat, after you're around the leeward mark, if you're still behind, do something. It doesn't matter what it is. Make your opponent work. So start tacking. If they're in the same tack as you, tack. If they tag back to W, tack again. You don't even have to think about it. Just go do something different. That's all that. Uh, just, just <coughs> let me preempt that. M Mark's kind of on both sides. He's, he match races quite a bit. He also does the umpiring thing and pitches in with the women's events. So he, he knows of what he speaks. Uh, one of the situations we saw that, uh, you know, Mark's, Mark's doing reaching times. Uh, going up here might be relevant if you're at a match race venue that has current. But coming down here is a slow point of sale and to think that you're going to maybe just time down coming this way and then kick into the line is really slow. Uh, you're already giving away <laughs> on port entry. You want to come in with speed to potentially cross or if or cross in this situation, cross ahead or if you're on time and they're late you want to have as much steam on as you can to get over here, get on the other board and keep the starboard entry boat out. That worked a couple, for, for one situation, you got that two minutes. Um, it can go for both of you. So the timing, Mark was saying, the timing is critical and have max speed when you're entering that line. Uh, we saw some people uh, luffing sails, that's fine, or if you find that you're, you're, looks like you're really pressing to go up a bit, but the only reason you might want to be up here is if you're, if you're uh, uh, in, a, in a current situation, that uh, you don't want to be over the line early or you don't want to be driven below. Um, I, I can't see coming down as being an optimal way of entry. Yes? Um, just about that uh, entering the starting zone. Um, if you enter any time between five minutes and four minutes, are you automatically penalized? Not or is it just at four, whether you're on the course side? Or I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I didn't want to finish, interrupt your question. At four minutes, you need to be out. You can be in here <coughs> at 4.15. Gotcha. You want to be here at four. Ideally, you'd want to be entering, not exiting. But you can be in there in that last, but you can't be in there early. Whether you're going in or out, we don't care. You just can't be in the age at four, at zero time. And, uh, you know, that's happened, I, I think, even the, I think Dave Perry, the one last year at, at Salonica, the timing got off. It happens. But, again, that's an unforced air. He was able to burn the penalty off. Anything else? I got one. Yep. One of the things uh, I, uh, uh, that was happening on the umpire boat is we were talking about uh, situations and we're constantly saying, you know, if, if someone has committed a penalty or uh, is a penalty, we'll say if there's a white flag, penalty blue, penalty yellow. I found myself saying a lot, if there's a white flag, penalty blue, or penalty yellow, and there was no white flag. Uh, and so I think it's important to really 
Uh, remember to put the white flag up if you're, especially if you're in a tight maneuver. But one thing that sticks in my mind, uh, because it was a, it was it was an interesting dialogue. I don't remember the match. I think maybe it was it was a close one with St. Thomas and Miami. I think uh, where. Uh, sailing off to the left side of the course, I think uh, St. Thomas got over Miami, I think, and got clear ahead. And uh, we were in the umpire boat. I think it was Kathy and I in the umpire boat. We were right back here. And they had gotten past the ley line uh, to finish. And as soon as they got that past the ley line to finish, and the boat, uh, uh, the, the weather boat is clear ahead, <laughs> we're talking constantly about whether the trailing boat has established an overlap. And if it's established from behind, it's a 17 overlap. Which means that this boat, who is preventing this boat from sailing her proper course, has to jive as soon as she gets to the ley line. Or she's broken 17, she's sailing above her proper course if they're overlapped. And that happened. Uh, St. Thomas got ahead, Miami came in and established the overlap, and we said, if there's a flag, it's a penalty. And there was no flag from St. Thomas, I think, or no, that would have been from, there was no flag from, from St. Thomas. Uh, but that's one thing to remember when you're in this situation. If you're the outside boat and it's close, you're not real sure if there was an overlap or not, and you're past the ley line, <coughs> the flag, uh, just to get the umpire's opinion. And it's true over here, uh, coming into the finish, whether the pin or the boat, or in the forward <coughs> mark. Pay real close attention to your ley lines and how that works. Yeah, we, we were winging on that, and I saw it was going on and off, on and off, and uh, I just said to the, my fellow uh, wing person, I said, you know, I'm expecting a jibe. We're waiting for the jibe. And it, it was slow in coming. It finally came, but uh, I was expecting a flag as well, uh, a Yankee flag. Anything else? Ohio's in this a lot, aren't they? Okay. Um, Ohio was, was very late at entry, and Sean, you were coming in with some really good speed, and we thought you had him dialed up perfectly to keep him out. But it seemed like to us that you opened the door for him, that you made a course alteration, allowing him to jive around the mark. You, you did flag him, but just wondering from your point of view, um, if you were expecting the penalty, why you didn't shut the door on him? Why you didn't keep that door shut? Um, yeah, I guess, um, well, I thought it was close enough that I was kind of altering for just to stay clear of him, and that's why I did fly the flag. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay. I My feel answer. like the first alteration was a result of coming in. Okay. Ohio's point of view? It, Thanks for the gift. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looked it looked like they weren't thinking to shut us out, so we just went around it real fast. Okay, so you, you saw the room and you we took saw it. the room and we took, it. took it. Okay, okay, just want, just wondering. Yeah, Sean, I think in that case, really keep keep yeah keep keep aimed. Don't alter course before, because I think what you did is you altered, allowing them to come in and take right. that room. Okay. Again, it's it's not that starboard tack is not altering course. It's that I mean you can alter course. They and they have to keep moving. They just have to keep moving. So as soon as as long as they're moving, you can keep nudging them to where they're going. You know, if 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 they're if there's contact, <coughs> they're doing everything possible, then you're in trouble. <coughs> but if there's no contact and at the last second you're even you can even throw it over a little bit hard and avoid the contact. Then you've got them dialed up. They're they're on the court side. You know they're closer to Never Never Land than you are, and uh, just, just keep right on going. There were a lot of 
cases today where the starboard tack boat let the port tack boat off the hook. Uh, I, I think they, they let them off the hook more than they let them on, but then they, they actually trapped them up, up in that windward situation. So, uh, so if you were on port tack, you, you got lucky a whole bunch of times. Um, and, and the, uh, so I, I think, yeah, that's enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> now there is one situation you get in a in a uh, a 17 overlap where the luff goes over the core side at time at zero time when the signal goes off. What's the proper course for the boat that established the 17? Go back to start, <coughs> and that would be promptly go back to start. Um, break away. Uh, you, you don't have to. You don't have a starting angle to one of the ley lines. But if you're above the starting line at time zero and you had it, you were in a 17 overlap. The proper course is to go back to start, either around the ends, dip the line. But that needs to happen quite promptly. The umpires will be counting that time off. If it's if you you linger there. Uh, the the boat that had established that 17 could buy a penalty. Does everybody know what a 17 overlap is? It's from coming from clear astern within two of your hull lengths. Very frequently at, at the uh, uh, in the last 45 seconds, 30 seconds definitely, one boat will be leading and one will be pushing or trying to get them up. You get this overlap here. That's 17 overlap. So the umpires or the wing will, what we'll be calling overlap, overlap. The wing in the last 30 seconds is probably going to be on the leeward side. We want to be able to see this. Uh, you could rotate up and it's clear. This will be the dialogue that the wing is giving the umpire over the radio. We'll be gauging it by dimension. You know, clear one meter, clear one half meter, 17 will be the call. So now the umpire knows that that's the type of, the umpires are going to make their own decisions. Sometimes you'll just get an overlap call. If the umpires believe that is a 17, they'll be looking for the time. They'll be discussing, are we going to start? In the last 30 seconds, definitely, we're going to be starting here very shortly. We're in the approach. So they're cognizant of this being established. Depending on the sea conditions, and that's, Part of our, our defined rule of room is in the prevalent condition. So uh, if it's blowing 15 knots out, establishing this overlap with a half meter is probably not giving adequate room. It might be more than adequate if it's blowing three knots. But how quickly you gain this overlap, and then this boat is um, very rapidly, I, I think there's this trigger finger on the Y flag, uh, that if they know they have a 17, and, and that it immediately starts flagging. And you might get a green initially, but that, that whole process is, is rather dynamic and, and happening rather quickly. This boat may be uh, trying to kill some time if they're early. So when, when this overlap is established and then broken, there is some uh, bearing on the trailing boat. Because if there is contact, and it was immediately broken and they, they run into them, the, the trailing boat could buy a penalty there. And we were discussing this uh, at the uh, event uh, early in the season. That dynamic of, of fish tailing can go to both boats. Anything else? <coughs> Does that cover the 17 issue? So the proper course is, is the, uh, the issue in 17. It's just like Hans was, was talking about Getting a 17 as you're approaching maybe a lured mark. The trailing boat would want to slow. <coughs> don't get to 17. You can take them way past as long as you don't establish that. <coughs> and outside the zone. So it, 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 to, to, get an, to get a lured overlap to luff is fine. If it's a 17 overlap and you're near the ley line, you have an obligation of proper course. So maybe holding back would be the optimal move because here, jiving so close and onto the other board puts them in giveaway position. You're on starboard, 
they can't do that right in front of you because of the, uh, the ob rights obligation. So, how many people are psyched about that they can go match racing tomorrow morning? Uh, isn't it neat? I mean, it's, 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 it's an exciting part of sailing and it's really fun to do and, and I'm, I'm actually jealous of you guys because I think, you know, kind of as, as an initial <coughs> coming into this for the, for the first time or the tenth time or uh, early, there's a lot to learn and, and it's pretty easy to see where your mistakes are and, and what you're going to do next time to see the same pattern. So, it's, uh, it's a good time. Talk tonight among your team. Talk about dialogues. Talk about how to how to do effective dialogues when you're coming in here and and uh, coming into the line. And the last one is if you ever get in trouble, if you're ever sitting there and you look behind and you're being controlled by somebody and you got it's that oh shit moment. What do you do? Stop. Go head to wind. Bluff. Get the other person going uh, head to win. Hopefully they go past you. Hopefully you can escape and get over into the into the playground, in, into uh, uh, whatever that was way off to the right. Exactly. The, those situations where you, you, you keep going off this way and Lou wants to get back, just stop. You're 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 lured right there. This boat has to keep clear of you. Sit there a while. Uh, toward the the latter uh, flights saw some of the foredeck starting to go forward and starting to control the jib. Do everything you can. You, you may not be able to get to the right, but you are the right-of-way boat yeah. here. Ge generally, if you're in trouble <coughs> and you're moving through the water, you're not moving toward any place you want to be. <laughs> okay. You're going, so you're going fast in the wrong stop. direction. <laughs> uh, last year we started talking uh, with, uh, with the inception of, of the U.S. Sailing Center uh, in Sheboygan, we started talking about how to bring more events here. And we, we, we talked very specifically about junior events and the collegiate events. We spoke with a lot of the, the uh, uh, teams that had uh, booth space at Strictly Sail in Chicago. And we're, we're really pleased that you're here. And like, like Kat had said, take it back to your other team members that aren't here. Uh, there are a number of open and women's events that will be uh, uh, structured here. And uh, uh, for those who are on the women's side of the equation, go to the Women's International Match Race Association. It's a full calendar of events around the world. Uh, <coughs> the open events are going on here, and on the, at least on the Great Lakes here, Detroit and Chicago. There's, there's a lot more match racing going on in the last two years. And like Pat, I'm, I'm really keyed up about this. This is a, a great way of getting a lot of racing in in a shorter period of time. I think it plays very well for collegiate sailing, where you usually have two days. Um, our races aren't very long. Somebody commented in the bathroom, the boat isn't as cold. It isn't as cold as sailing a dinghy. Uh, so that's a good thing. But uh, so I, we, we have dinner tonight, right, Kathy? We do. Okay, so that's is how every day she was fired for coming. Ten dollars. This is a pretty big announcement. Everybody uh, really think about Timmy's last year. How you spent eighty dollars on it? How much better this is? Oh, we spent ten dollars here. First of all, congratulations to all of you. Floor.